Well, let's move on. Uh, what would you have to say about, okay, uh, the Middle Ages we could look at as mm -hmm. pretty much uh, a time when tradition was highly honored and yeah. and and uh, th the past gave a lot of direction to what they were doing at that time. But then then the uh, Reformation comes along. If you want to say something about the Middle Ages, fine. But then it seems to me that maybe where the it would be interesting to hear from you is where the disruption hits, yeah. which is the Reformation. And here's where things, things get pretty messy. Um, you have the apostolic church and the, 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 the kind of a, the biblical work we've done with, with tradition, strong affirmation of it. Mm -hmm. and I think also uh, in the early church, very significant rule that <laughs> in a lot of ways our inheritance from that tradition is the New Testament. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously there's, there's, this, there's the Old Testament too that's, mm -hmm, that's mm -hmm. really instrumental here. But our inheritance from the early church of their tradition is the writings that we have, mm -hmm. which is the New Testament. Mm -hmm. What begins to happen, and I'm painting with broad strokes here, but it seems like maybe in the, in the Middle Ages, tradition itself begins mm -hmm. to really swell up and take on it has its own needs, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. And it, it starts to get it starts to get pretty large. So um, tradition, which up till now I've heard you talk about very positively, yeah. it does have a danger. Yes. Okay, go that's ahead. That's right. Go yeah. ahead. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and here's where I think we begin to see some of the dangers of what happens when tradition just starts to take on its own proportions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, just to be specific, a few examples. There's, you know, the interpretation of scripture, which is really tightly bound to tradition in Roman Catholicism uh, it becomes so tangled and complex that it's kind of reserved for the elite. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. They have their own language, it's the mm -hmm. magisterium, right? Mm -hmm. And they're the final authority because scripture seen as too complex. Um, there's maybe Mariology, you know, the, the, the esteem of Mary as maybe the mother of God, you'd say, but it seems to take on some really big proportions in, mm -hmm. in Roman piety. Mm -hmm. um, there's the seeming like kind of magical qualities of the mass and relics. Mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. indulgences. Mm -hmm. um, these are things that tradition in and of itself is kind of starts to swell up, it seems, and takes up space that maybe mm -hmm. it wasn't, wasn't supposed to. Mm -hmm. So I, th I think you can understand one way to understand the Reformation is as a response to all of these excesses mm -hmm. that have developed in tradition. And when the Reformation comes, <laughs> I'm the instrument of correction here, instead of the regulation being the tradition, mm -hmm. scripture is now what begins to regulate tradition. Mm -hmm. So there's something of a reversal mm -hmm. that happens mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. Just to, to give some examples, I mean, there's the magisterial Protestants. These would be the Protestants who have a good many things uh, in common with the Roman Catholic Church at this mm -hmm. time. And they wanted to see the state and the church continue to work together. Right. Um, the magisterial Protestants, uh, they're talking about sola scriptura, the scripture alone. Um, they, they could see, I guess you'd say they'd see scripture taking uh, a slightly more modest regulative mm -hmm. rule. They still see a lot of, they have a high esteem for tradition still. So yeah. Lutheran, uh, some of the reform circles, some of them, uh, some of their heirs as well. They're, they're seeing scripture being really important, but it's, it's, it's more modest. They still give a lot of space for tradition. Um, and what happens, they're talking about the authority of scripture. They're whacking off some of what say they see the excesses of tradition are, but still a lot of room for tradition. Mm -hmm. And then they, they, they make texts available, uh, and say for Luther, when the, when the New Testament becomes, when scripture becomes available to the people of Europe in languages they can understand, he's actually kind of shocked mm -hmm. at what they do with that. He mm -hmm. thought if you make mm -hmm. scripture available, things would maybe just sort of correct themselves. And instead, there's the peasant rebellion. Mm -hmm. And he can't get on board with that. Um, Although the peasants were quoting him. <laughs> well, they're, they're quoting him and they're quoting scripture. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and they're, they're, they're throwing off the shackles of tradition and they're, 
They're trying to find their voice, and, and Luther, he's confused, he doesn't know what to do, but eventually he sides with tradition, mm -hmm. and he has the uprising crushed, or he gives permission for it, that mm -hmm. is. Um, so you see, there, there, there's adjustment there, but with the magisterial Protestants in general, scripture performs a more modest kind of regulative role, and tradition is still functionally there. Um, the Anabaptists, they come down uh, more decidedly on the authority of Christ mm -hmm. and on the authority of Scripture. Uh, they, they, they're, they're seeing in Scripture the, the sources you know, and the sources, I think, that they had of the early church, but also with the, 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 the resources that they had around them in their culture. There's, you know, Benedictine culture, there's um, some sources of, of, say, German spirituality that they're looking at, and they're drawing mm -hmm. from all of these resources, and, and they're, they're kind of working with them, and they see this, this blueprint, maybe especially in the New Testament, for, for kinds of communities. Mm -hmm. And they see, they see a social form that the gospel is taking, and, and they, they begin to live this out in some, in some really, a really exciting way. Through the, the Holy Spirit, I guess you could say, uh, these communities that they're forming, they, they see themselves as part of, of part of God's new creation in the world. They're part of God's people. And, mm -hmm. and here these lively communities are, and they're part mm -hmm. of God's new creation. And they have their own goals. Mm -hmm. I mean, they have their own methods, their own ways of doing things that sets them apart from the magisterials. And they have their own distinctive ways of being in the world. Mm -hmm. um, you, see, you see here something of a rejection, I think, of at least the medieval Roman Catholic tradition. Mm -hmm. And there's also some distinction here from the magisterial Protestants mm -hmm. uh, because of their willingness, the magisterial, to use coercive force mm -hmm. and to align with the state. Mm -hmm. There's something interesting happening here. Yeah. Real quick, uh, there's two things I want to ask you about on this. Uh, you made a seeming distinction between authority of Christ and authority of Scripture as you were just talking a bit ago. Did you mean it that way or did I just hear more than uh, you were talking about the Anabaptists yeah uh, and and uh, is there a distinction uh, in your mind uh, don't, don't have to go into much detail cause, and then I have another question about the, uh, the Anabaptists yeah. and tradition uh, it's an important question um, I wouldn't make a distinction there okay the there is the truth of Scripture is how truthfully it testifies to Christ yeah um, and it does so yeah. consistently and throughout the entirety of Scripture, mm -hmm. I think you'd say. Mm -hmm. It's pointing to Christ, and it does that uniformly. Mm -hmm. It does that consistently, and it does that truthfully. Mm -hmm. um, you don't want to collapse the two and say that, say, the New Testament and Jesus are the same thing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it's always witnessing truthfully to Christ. It's witnessing to Christ, yeah, very good. Now you mentioned um, that the, these uh, Anabaptists came up with new social forms. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna ask you a question about something that has always intrigued me a lot about the Anabaptists and in, indeed the early cr uh, Christians. Um, the uh, Anabaptists were very uh, insistent mm -hmm. that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and that uh, became a key economical uh, economic um, concept for them. Hmm. Do you have anything to say on that? Uh, this, this is kind of a shot out of the blue, <laughs> so if not, that's fine. But I've always been impressed by the Old Testament and what it says about economics and how the Anabaptists um, uh, approach economics very different. From, they were so different from the hmm. average medieval a person that they were accused of being communist, which was not true, mm. but well, unless they were Hutterites. But uh, so, you ha if you have something on that, fine. If not, um, because this would be a way that they were actually plugging into the tradition. Yeah, yeah. But they were also uh, countering that more recent medieval tradition. I think you really made a good point there that um, something happened in the Middle Ages. It didn't destroy everything as far as tradition, yeah. but it it took the train off the track huh. and it needed to get back on. Uh, but anyway, so if you had anything on the economical, uh, economic section, yeah. uh, that's okay. If not, we'll well, go you, on. You hear this, you know, the earth is the Lord's. It's, 
it's picked up really frequently by the Anabaptists and especially see it in court records, mm -hmm. which is where it would have been recorded, but they're, they're, mm -hmm. they're using this other places as well. Mm -hmm. When the Anabaptists say that the earth is the Lord's, some of the responses they tend to have to that are, like you say, there's a real economic effect it has on them. Mm -hmm. and, and it seems like they're motivated. They're, they're, they're seeing how, how resourceful God is. Mm -hmm and they're celebrating how freely God gives himself yeah. to the world. And then mm -hmm. their response to that is just a one of overflow. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, if this is who God is, then the things that I have, the resources I have aren't really my own. And, mm -hmm. and I, can, I, can, I can give my resources without being really all that self-conscious mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. that's what the Father does. He takes mm -hmm. care of us okay. and he's the resourceful one. Okay. Uh, for me, that also helps me to understand how free they are with their lives. Yeah. I mean, it's, if the earth is the Lord's and they're his new creation, um, what the Father does with them, that's up to him. And, mm -hmm. and they, they become really free with themselves. Mm -hmm. Very, and I mean by that, very, very self-giving. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And very open to being humiliated even mm -hmm. in ways that, that uh, well, it's, it's hard to read sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Well, very good. Um, let's, uh, move it forward. So do you, what do you have to say about uh, what is passed on or the, this greater thing that we have, uh, tradition, whatever you want to call it? Hmm. What about in the more contemporary world? So let's say anywhere in the last 200 years, uh, what would you like to say about um, how the church has uh, looked at and worked with tradition? Well, I think I'll, I'll just highlight two, two possible responses two tradition that, that seem, and both of these probably negative responses that the church has tradition. There's a lot of positive response here too. Mm -hmm. Two negative possibilities, say in the last 200 years, might be this. Um, the one is this heritage of modern scholarship okay. that <laughs> it tries to so thoroughly minimize tra tradition hmm. that not only does it just want to get back to, say, the New Testament, it wants to go further back yet. Mm -hmm. And there's a real suspicion of uh, what we would just consider to be Orthodox Christian teaching. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're so suspicious of that, so suspicious of the kind of power that it seems to them that early Christian leaders were exercising. They, they don't even trust that. So they mm -hmm. need to get behind the New Testament before there's such a thing as this rule of faith and just kind of see what really happened mm -hmm. back there. Mm -hmm. It's in that suspicion you see things like um, the Jesus Seminar mm -hmm. coming out and there's some resurgences and reiterations of that where the, the goal is to, to, to dismantle everything that's just in our way, like tradition, right? Mm -hmm. And we're just gonna see Jesus for who he actually was. Mm -hmm. it's, really quite the claim to make, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, there's the Da Vinci Code, probably a pretty popularized attempt, I think, to do much the same thing. It's like, mm -hmm. ah, there was this conspiracy and you're just kind of being hoodwinked by tradition, mm -hmm. but we know the real truth. Mm -hmm. And uh, kind of smacks of Gnosticism in mm -hmm. some ways in, in, a, in a new way. Um, a few authors, there's C.E. Hill and what he calls the Great Gospel Conspiracy. Uh, there's an author I'm not quite as familiar with, a Bauer historian. Um, he tells us that what we see as Orthodox Christian teaching is the real heresy. Mm -hmm. So Orthodoxy is now the heresy. <laughs> and um, what we actually see in Orthodox teaching is just a reflection of who managed to overpower who. Mm -hmm. And that's what we have now. And so I don't think he really tries to get beyond the New Testament. He just, he stops mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, he just wants to, to, to reveal the conspiracy that he sees there. So that's, that's pretty extreme, but that is, that's one possibility we can move toward, is just to try to dismantle the whole thing and throw it out, mm -hmm. because tradition is just suspicious, it's just power-mongering. Mm -hmm. A little bit more on the sanctified side of things, okay? Um, I would say that within the church, there's still, you know, this is within the Christian church, there's there is a lot of suspicion of what tradition can actually do for us. Mm -hmm. uh, the same, a lot of suspicion about what we could actually learn from history. Um, 
this is backing up further than say 200 years, but you could see some of this uh, as an inheritance perhaps of a number of groups, but of one group in particular, let's pick on a little bit, would maybe be the Puritans. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. they, they've got two problems to overcome. The first is that they, they really do not appreciate the excesses that they see mm -hmm. in Reformation churches, much less the Roman Catholic mm -hmm. Church. And they're very critical and sensitive to that. Mm -hmm. So they just go back to kind of a lockstep interpretation of the New Testament. Mm -hmm. And whatever is not in there is excluded. Only things that are permissible in Scripture are those explicitly stated. Mm -hmm. Okay, It's a very strong way to try to lop off any excesses, which they say a lot of them, mm -hmm. and return to what they see as New Testament Christianity. The other difficulty they have is this enormous disconnect, or really, a, it's, it's as though human and divine wills are actually fighting with each other. And that's something they get from Calvin, you could mm -hmm. say. Mm -hmm. um, and they're struggling with how it is that us fallen human beings with our corrupted wills, how strongly they're in bondage to sin and death, they don't know how we could do anything good. Mm -hmm. And so the only thing we have to go back to is Scripture. Mm -hmm. And uh, they see that as kind of a refuge to, to overcome this disconnect between, <laughs> in their minds anyway, human and divine wills. Mm -hmm. So they go back to Scripture. They really don't have any other thing to say. Mm -hmm. There's a long heritage, I think, especially in the evangelical church, of distrust mm -hmm. for anything related to tradition, Mm -hmm. Perhaps going back to some of those Puritans, or the Puritans just give us a, a, a really clear example, I think, of what mm -hmm. that looks like. Mm -hmm. So two negative examples, anyway. Okay. Uh, you've talked, th now I, I'm going to ask a question about, uh, you mentioned it just a bit ago, but it was really prominent when, when you were talking about the early church, the rule of faith. Yeah. Um, uh, the, to me, that's a very important thing, and one of the things that developed out of it was the creed. And... Uh, and uh, for me, uh. the cre do you have anything to say about creedal proclamations? Um, I won't say what I would, I mean, uh, for me, they're very important, but do you have anything to say uh, about the Nicene Creed or the Apostles' Creed, which, both of which would have their roots in the uh -huh. uh, rule of faith? It seems so important to try to appreciate what the church is trying to accomplish mm -hmm. with things like the creed, especially mm -hmm. Nicaea. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're myself, I've come to, I mean, when you understand the challenges that the early church was facing, and sometimes it seems like the unlikelihood that it was going to survive. Mm -hmm. in very turbulent times, mm -hmm. opposition without, opposition within, mm -hmm. and Christ is there in the middle saying, I will build my church, mm -hmm. and he's dead serious about that. Mm -hmm. What I see in the creeds is the church's response to some of these challenges, mm -hmm. but the point of it again isn't just to make formulas, mm -hmm. okay? It's not to pin God down. Mm -hmm. It's actually to maintain the space. Mm -hmm where we can actually celebrate and enjoy God, life as some of God's creatures and respond in the kind of repentance mm -hmm. and faith that we need. Mm -hmm. So there is some boundary setting there, sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there is some, some kind of condensing of what we've learned about God mm -hmm. through Christ and through mm -hmm. His interaction with us. But it's, they're not intended to be a substitute mm -mm. somehow no, no. For, for the rest of things. So mm -hmm. I, there... You have to be careful how you approach them, I think. Mm -hmm. But um, when, when we approach the creeds in the way that I think they were intended, in the function they were intended to have, mm -hmm. um, we should be able to appreciate them mm -hmm. for what they are. Mm -hmm. um, and you can, I mean, there's, you can go off and there's, I'm sure there's Nicaea in the 300s, so how far do we want to go? I'm going to stop short of, say, scholasticism or something like mm -hmm. that. Yeah. <laughs> I think we pretty much exhausted it by then. But, okay. um, yeah, a, an appreciation of the creeds feels appropriate. Did you have anything else you want to say about uh, our, our larger heritage that we've been given? Huh. Um, well, I, think, I think one of the, one of the points I just need to make is, is that everybody has a tradition. Mm-hmm. 
okay? The, the people who are trying to dig underneath tradition and get beyond the text of, or behind the text of the New Testament, that's a tradition, mm -hmm. okay? Um, it's one that's self-obsessed. Mm -hmm. It's one that is ultimately self-defeating. Like Chesterton says, just busy undermining its own minds. Mm -hmm. Where do you stop? Mm -hmm. um, the Christian traditions who claim to reject tradition, well, <laughs> that too is a tradition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and and this, this is a little, this is somewhat critical, but I, I think what I would say to, to either kind, to, to any tradition that's trying to reject tradition is mm -hmm. what usually tends to happen is that there's just a lot of discussions that are cleared off the table. Mm -hmm. And that's all that's actually happening. Mm -hmm. There still are all of the assumptions and liabilities and strengths mm -hmm. of tradition that are present there. Mm -hmm. We just can't talk about them anymore. Mm -hmm. They're kind of submerged or hidden. Mm -hmm. um, so my response to, to, to anybody, you know, to claim that you're living without tradition, well, you are. Mm -hmm. Everybody has a tradition. Mm -hmm. The most destructive traditions that are there claim not to be traditions. Mm -hmm. Our job is many times to excavate a little bit behind and say, well, there's, there's actually continuity here. This is a tradition to hear the strengths, hear the liabilities, and especially as Christians to come to our own tradition, mm -hmm. not being self-absorbed in it, mm -hmm. uh, not elevating mm -hmm. it too highly, but then we can actually talk about it mm -hmm. and recognize it for what it is and bring it to the Word and have Him evaluate and judge mm -hmm. and work with us where we're at. But it's a much stronger place to be, I think, than to claim that there's no tradition. Well, I will agree with you on that. <laughs> okay. So thank you, Kyle, for this uh, discussion, and uh, uh, thank you for tuning in. Mm -hmm.